It was the summer of 2006, and tensions within the Highwayman Motorcycle Club were reaching a fever pitch. Just past its 50th year of existence, the Detroit-based biker gang had sprawled from a small social club of like-minded motorcycle enthusiasts into a powerful network that included some who worked the assembly line by day and trafficked drugs by night. Those within the highwaymen who trafficked in narcotics had built up ingeniously crafted supply lines. But recently, there had been a series of major busts by the DEA, and there was no way the feds could possibly get that lucky that many times in a row. There was just one inescapable conclusion. Someone within the highwaymen was a turncoat. This needed to be addressed, and fast. Around the state, meetings were called. The Highwaymen's many Michigan chapters included one, known as West Side, with a clubhouse on Warren Avenue, and a vice president named Arif Steve Nagy, who was ready to launch a witch hunt for whoever was snitching. At West Side's meeting, this was addressed in no uncertain terms. Quote, We have a snitch in this clubhouse, and that person needs to be put down. Sitting in a chair a few feet away, one man tried to control his nervousness as he listened to those words. For months, he'd been meeting with federal agents, using DEA money to purchase cocaine and marijuana from his fellow club members, and even wearing a wire. His efforts had not been in vain. They'd given the feds enough to listen in on thousands of phone calls, and more recently, to raid stash houses and intercept shipments of drugs. Before long, the FBI would whisk him away into witness protection so quickly it would be years before he would see his kids. And he wouldn't see many of his fellow highwaymen again either, until it was time to enter a federal courthouse and face them from his chair on the witness stand. When this person was eventually discovered, his picture would be placed on highwaymen clubhouses with the word RAT scrawled on it in black ink. The Highwaymen had been betrayed many times over the club's half-century in existence up to that point, with significant consequences. In fact, the FBI, DEA, and local police have been playing a cat-and-mouse game with the Highwaymen for decades. Within the FBI, they were known as HOMG for Highwaymen Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. Members of the Highwaymen had been rung up on RICO charges before from the era when firebombings were common between warring motorcycle clubs, to the days when the feds had alleged that there was a secret group within the highwaymen known as the Lightning Rods that relied on depravity and violence. The Highwaymen Motorcycle Club was formed in 1954 by a man named Elburn Barnes, aka Big Max, who was only 22 when he and others started a motorcycle social club, comprising mostly war veterans and auto workers. In the ensuing years, outlaw motorcycle clubs, commonly known as one percenters, would proliferate throughout the United States and become their own cultural icon that evoked the renegade American spirit. Perhaps nowhere was this more true than in Michigan, where the cold winters left only a brief three-month period commonly known as riding season. And yet, motorcycle clubs sprung up all over the state full of dues-paying members who willingly dedicated their money and sparse free time into building up these secretive organizations. But with motorcycle clubs' rising popularity came turf wars and violence. And as the 60s gave way to the 70s, the highwaymen emerged as the top dog statewide. Thanks in no small part to Big Max's leadership, it adopted a constitution and hierarchy with strict rules about paying dues attending rallies and motorcycle runs, keeping violence between club members to an absolute minimum, and above all else, keeping club business a secret. As the Highwaymen expanded throughout the country, its Detroit clubhouse would forever be known as the Mother Chapter, the brain trust and the main hub for those who pledged allegiance to the club. In 1980, when Big Max died of a heart attack at the age of 48, his funeral was as much a show of force as it was a somber moment. Hundreds of patched-up biker clubs members, with names such as the Outcasts, Vigilantes, Iron Mustangs, Henchmen, and Broad Jumpers, and of course the Highwaymen, rumbled down to a Detroit funeral home, 
They stood in a line and fired off a 21-gun salute with automatic shotguns and listened to a clergyman pay his final respects. One highwayman member known as the Hatchet had this to say, quote, he was indestructible. He had been shot, stabbed, blowed up, and I don't know what all. He was like George Patton as far as we were concerned. Within and outside the highwaymen, Big Max will forever be known as the Godfather, a title that adorns his gravestone underneath the highwayman logo of a winged skull wearing the club's signature cap. But the 80s would mark a turning point for the group, one that came in the form of an unexpected betrayal. In July of 1986, a Lansing State Journal reporter named Mike Gallagher was assigned to investigate rampant corruption within the Detroit state prison system. But then Gallagher made contact with Lonnie Hamilton, one of two Muskegon prisoners who was brave enough to risk reprisals from both guards and other inmates to talk to the media on the record. Hamilton gave the reporter some insights on the corrections officer corruption. But as the two chatted, it became clear to Gallagher that Hamilton's past was worth a major news story all on its own. By 1986, Lonnie Hamilton had been behind bars for 13 years. It started when he was arrested in Tennessee for a strong-arm robbery. Hamilton was a bit of a wanderer who traveled the country committing one dirty deed or another. But when Tennessee authorities pressed him, he willingly confessed to murder back in his native state of Michigan. The victim was known only by her first name, Joyce. She was a carnival worker from Texas who traveled with the show from state to state and made the mistake of flashing a roll of cash in front of Lonnie and a friend while playing cards in a Michigan apartment. Lonnie offered the young woman a ride to nearby Oakland County, but it was just a ruse. He and his friend robbed her on the ride there, and when Joyce threatened to call the cops, Lonnie pulled over, took Joyce into the brush, and strangled her. Thirteen years into Lonnie's life sentence, he declared he was a servant of his newfound Christian religion and wanted to confess some more. The end result was a cover story by Gallagher in Section G of the Lansing State Journal, featuring a full image of Lonnie glaring at the camera with his highwayman and lightning bolt tattoos fully visible on his right forearm, next to the phrase, deadly bikers. In his interview with Gallagher, Lonnie had unveiled himself as a man named Loner, who had run in with a secret group inside the highwaymen known as the Lightning Rods. They were, as Lonnie put it, quote, professional killers, rapists, drug and gun dealers. He further made the outlandish claim that the Lightning Rods actually required new members to commit a murder in front of two other established members, completely turning on its head the phrase adopted by biker gangs like the Hells Angels, three can keep a secret if two are dead. But perhaps most consequential about Lonnie's story was the fact that he had been repeating it behind closed doors during a federal grand jury proceeding. In fact, just one year after Lonnie's story was featured in the journal, a grand jury in Michigan handed down a 15-count federal indictment targeting 22 highwaymen, including the man who'd risen to take Big Max's place as its ultimate leader, as well as another man who would one day come to be adorned with the same title that Big Max himself had earned, the new godfather of the highwaymen, known as Leonard Dad Moore. The indictment of the 1980s was likely on the minds of many highwaymen in the mid-2000s, when the problem of infiltration by federal informant had become too obvious to ignore. With chapters throughout Michigan known as Detroit, Eastside, Westside, Eight Mile, Lansing, Monroe, Downriver, and Washtenaw, the highwaymen were still well established in the state, and many of their leaders were just as well known in legitimate society as they were in the local underworld. These included men like the aforementioned Steve Nagy, who owned a Mexican restaurant in Dearborn called Pancho Villas, as well as Gary Ball Jr., a longtime highwayman, an excellent networker who had ties to both the local Italian mafia, as well as street gangs and interstate drug traffickers. Then there was Bobby Burton, the West Side president who was also one of the biggest drug dealers of the highwaymen, and Phil McDonald, 
the owner of a local bar that had been raided by federal authorities to the tune of 47 kilos of cocaine around this time. All of them soon found their way onto an FBI bulletin board, and it was mostly thanks to one man, a brilliant new Westside Highwayman member named Doug Burnett, whose decision to go from a budding gangster to an informant was as seemingly random as it was helpful to the feds. Burnett had grown up a close friend of Big Max's grandson, and when he turned 21, he started frequenting the same bars as many highwaymen. Then, let it be known he wanted to put his name in the hat to join up. As a member, he would sell cocaine for Bobby Burton and was present for enforcement action, such as when Burton clocked a man in the head with a shovel inside a local bar for stealing highwayman t-shirts, sending the victim into a coma for several days. Then, one day, Doug Burnett simply decided to call it quits. He went to the local FBI office, announced his presence, and before long was meeting with people like Special Agent Ted Brzezinski, an FBI man who knew the highwaymen as the HOMG. Burnett volunteered to wear a wire, to conduct controlled buys, and later to testify. And he did all of this without anyone twisting his arm. He would later testify, quote, I didn't like what I became and what I was getting involved in. I basically just had enough. I mean, it would be only a matter of time before I knew that I would be in prison or dead. For Burnett, there was plenty to tell the FBI about. The highwaymen had built a seemingly rock-solid drug empire that imported marijuana from British Columbia and cocaine from sources in Florida, as well as drugs like ecstasy and even Viagra. When bulk shipments needed to be transported, the highwaymen would use welding to create secret compartments in tankers and lock them shut, making them almost impossible for authorities to detect. When they needed to talk on the phone, they would use the term Scooby Snacks as a code word for drugs. Then there was a lucrative motorcycle theft ring, which relied on multiple chop shops in the Detroit area to break down and build up bikes and fancy automobiles including 10 motorcycles taken from the Myrtle Beach Motorcycle Rally that were valued between $25,000 and $40,000 each. But the feds weren't satisfied with just using Burnett to take on the highwaymen. They wanted to kill two birds with one stone. For you see, the highwaymen's network included not just friendly biker clubs, but a Detroit street gang known as the Latin Counts, which was a part of the People Nation that included infamous gangs like the Vice Lords. Specifically, Burnett would tell the FBI that there was some crossover between Junior's cocaine business and a similar business run by a man named Anthony Vero Montez, known as Chocolate, a Chicago native who was credited with bringing the Latin Counts to Detroit after he survived being shot in the face in his hometown. In the early 90s, Vero Montez was in and out of prison, and the obsessive attempts to prosecute him had generated something of a local media frenzy. He was once even charged with murder only for a case to be dismissed in 2002 due to a lack of witness cooperation. At one point, Vera Montez publicly announced that his gang life was over and, quote, I would like for the cops, the lawyers, the prosecutors, the parents, the community leaders, the business sector to stop using my name for their satisfactual needs. By 2005, Vera Montez was out on the streets and still just as big of a law enforcement target as ever so the feds figured they could just send Burnett his way, too. At that point in time, the relationship between the highwaymen and the Latin Counts was hardly easy going. Doug Burnett would later recall that in one of their first meetings, Vera Montez looked him dead in the eyes and promised to murder his whole family if he crossed him. Thanks to Burnett's efforts, the FBI obtained wiretaps on Steve Nagy, Tony Vera Montez, Phil McDonald, Bobby Burton, and others. When the feds started raiding stash houses, pulling over drug couriers, and seizing dozens of pounds of pot and coke at a time, Nagy was furious that they were losing hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time and helped launch a witch hunt to weed out the snitch. Vera Montez's instincts led him right to Burnett, and while he had no proof at that time, he asked the highwayman Detroit president for permission to kill Burnett only to be met with the confusing answer that it was okay to proceed with the hit so long as Burnett wasn't wearing his highwayman vest at the time, so as to avoid a conflict between the biker club 
and the Latin counts. Of course, this conversation ended up on tape, too, resulting in two indictments that collectively charged more than 100 people with crimes ranging from drug trafficking and motorcycle theft to obstruction of justice to murder. It was one of the most sprawling prosecutions in Michigan's history. Allegations of witness intimidation or tampering continued all the way throughout the court process. The Highwaymen indictment included not only members of the biker club and their wives, but also four law enforcement personnel charged with either involvement in drug sales or informing the Highwaymen of suspected government informants, as well as two attorneys accused of public corruption or being directly involved in Highwaymen illegal business while carrying themselves as trusted members of the legal community. In fact, both Steve Nagy and Junior Ball's personal lawyers were both charged, though the results wouldn't be quite what the feds had in mind. The indictment not only charged dozens of Highwaymen members and associates, it was the beginning of a process that would end with the government attempting to seize the main Highwaymen clubhouse on Michigan Avenue, under the legal theory that it was being used as a safe space for cocaine sales, with the full knowledge and approval of the leadership. Out of the dozens of individuals charged with federal crimes, perhaps the most important were Steve Nagy, Junior Ball, Dad Moore, Detroit President Joe Whiting, and Michael Cicchetti, and Anthony Clark, who are part of a leadership committee with Nagy, Whiting, and Dad Moore. These six men were jointly tried in 2010. By the time the trial began, much had changed. For one thing, Bobby Burton, Phil McDonald, and another co-defendant named Daniel Rocket Sanchez had all decided to join Doug Burnett as prosecution witnesses in exchange for legal leniency. Or another thing, just months before the trial, a co-defendant named Dennis Gon Van Hull was shot in the neck inside his Detroit home and died soon after. His best friend, a man named Ron Higgendorf, was arrested based on the fact that Van Hull had written Higgendorf's name on a piece of paper as he lay dying. And while Higgendorf would be found guilty, his trial was complicated by the fact that Van Hull had warned his girlfriend that Bobby Burton and other highwaymen were after him for refusing an order to kill or assault Liberty Riders members on sight. Van Hull's murder just happened a few weeks before jury selection against the six defendants began. The trial lasted for two months, but perhaps no day was more significant than when Daniel Rocket Sanchez took the stand. It started off slow, with Rocket simply explaining how he'd graduated from a gang called the Spanish Cobras to the Highwaymen, because the latter represented the, quote, upper echelon of the underworld. He was describing a 1999 power struggle between Anthony Clark and Bobby Burton when there was a disturbance in the court. From the back of the gallery, a woman's voice could be heard. She stood up. He murdered my son, she yelled, referring to Rocket. Courtroom pandemonium ensued. The judge excused the jury and the woman and called all six defense teams and both prosecutors to the bench to figure out who she was and what to do about it. When the judge asked prosecutor Christopher Graveline if he knew who the woman was, he balked. It was at this very moment the feds were forced to publicly reveal the full scope of the investigation into the highwayman. Graveline told the judge that the woman could be there about, quote, any one of the three or four unsolved killings that they were investigating. Judge Nancy Edmonds called the woman back into court. It turned out her name was Tammy McAleer, and her son was Juan Butler, a 19-year-old man who in 1999 had been beaten and stabbed dozens of times before his body turned up in the Detroit River a few days later. When Daniel Sanchez agreed to testify, he had provided a lengthy debrief statement in which he admitted to luring Butler to a highwayman clubhouse to be killed and claimed that Dad Moore and Anthony Clark had joined in murdering Butler, disposing of his body, and actually setting the clubhouse on fire to cover up the crime. No one was ever charged, and in an attempt to muddy the waters, one of the defendants leaked a message to Tammy that her son's killer had gotten immunity and would be taking the witness stand on this very day. Defiant in the face of an angry judge, Tammy proclaimed, You know what? It's been 12 years. I've been in pain and I've been suffering. I can't sit back anymore. 
After a brief debate, Judge Edmonds admonished the jury to forget what they'd heard, and the trial resumed. At the trial's end, everyone was convicted for a range of crimes and sentenced to decades in federal prison. Many others took plea deals and also got prison sentences, while the cases against the four cops ended with either dismissals or diversion. Steve Nagy's lawyer took his trial to a judge and was fully acquitted, while prosecutors dismissed the case against the lawyer who had represented Junior. Meanwhile, the allegations that the highwaymen had gotten away with murder time and time again have never been publicly revisited, and one can only assume that these investigations are forever locked in a holding pattern, never to be resolved. But from his prison cell, Junior Ball seethed at what he saw as rampant corruption by the system, betrayal by his own lawyers, and a revelation that came out before Daniel Sanchez took the stand. When prosecutor Diane Marion revealed that there were still confidential informants working with the FBI within the highwaymen who had never been outed to the defense. Armed with nothing more than a pen and paper, Junior Ball started writing his own requests pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act from prison. And as the paperwork began to trickle in, some bombshells were dropped in his lap. Next, Junior found himself a new lawyer with some media savvy. The result was an April 30th, 2017 article by the Detroit Free Press with this prominently displayed accusation. That Steve Nagy, the very highwayman vice president who had been so determined to root out snitches from the club, had himself worked as a government informant years earlier. Nagy's attorney vehemently denied the accusation, insisting that the FOIA records must have referred to another era of Nagy. Junior claimed this raised the possibility that Nagy had been operating as a, quote, spy in the camp during trial. Though Judge Edmonds ultimately ruled that there was no evidence Nagy had ever cooperated for a federal law enforcement agency or against the highwaymen. Junior's bid to overturn his conviction was denied. And four years later, Nagy was granted an early release from prison by the same judge, who lauded Nagy for the extraordinary work he'd done to rehabilitate himself in prison. The following year came another twist. Diane Marion, the lead prosecutor against the highwaymen, was suspended from practicing law in Michigan for making a factual misrepresentation to a judge. While the finding was in no way tied to Marion's work on the highwayman case, it is a bit remarkable that she was now the fourth lawyer tied to the case who had been accused of some form of misconduct, dishonesty, or criminality on top of the four law enforcement officers who were criminally charged. In short, the highwaymen became just another reminder of Detroit's seemingly constant flow of public corruption, be it in the form of indicted politicians, criminal cops, or dishonest litigators. Something else happened last year that brings our story today to a full circle. In March of 2022, the Michigan Department of Corrections voted to parole Lonnie Loner Hamilton after 50 years behind bars for the murder of Joyce, the carnival worker. Lonnie was his typical repentant self at the parole hearing, making no bones about the man he was in his 20s, or about the fact that his come to Jesus moment brought about a transformation in his life. But one thing was different. When asked directly if he ever committed any other murders, Lonnie denied he ever had, in stark contrast to the story he told reporter Mike Gallagher, where he described himself as not only a paid gunslinger who traveled the country killing people as a highwayman, but as someone who'd indirectly contributed to countless murders by aiding a violent secret organization that operated within a secret criminal motorcycle club. While we know his victim was named Joyce, she was in her 20s, she was a carnival worker who hailed from Texas, and that she disappeared in 1973. No one, not even the police, have ever identified her or tracked down her family. Of course, Texas is a big state, and 50 years is a long time. But with the case now fully adjudicated, perhaps now is as good a time as any for anybody who could identify this young woman to come forward and help any of her remaining loved ones find closure. The much more likely possibility, of course, is that Joyce's true identity, 
much like the other several homicides mentioned herein, will remain an unsolved mystery. I was a highwayman Along the coach roads I did ride